Okay, so um, I'm the chair actually, and Sahil is the moderator. But it's fine. We we're fine together. Okay, yeah. so as Indu said, um, this is the last session. It's called Unwind, and I've been asked to inform everyone that this is Pragya Vakshi's favorite symposium. So now that that's out there, I would like to introduce my first speaker for the day, um, Professor Partha Kar. Uh, Professor Partha Kar is the National Specialty Advisor Diabetes with NHS. He is a consultant in diabetes and endocrinology at Portsmouth Hospital NHS Trust since 2008. He is a pioneer of the Super 6 diabetes model. Um, and more than that, I would like to talk a little bit about all the stuff he's involved with type 1 diabetes specifically. So he is involved, and I think the reason why Freestyle Libre is available on NHS across the country. Uh, he introduced the Diabetes Language Matters document, which we then also adapted into an Indian version. Uh, he set up pilot projects for diabulimia treatments in London and Wessex, and he is also the co-creator of TAD, which is talking about diabetes, and the co-creator of Type 1 Diabetes Comics, which we are also adapting into an Indian version. So, uh, someone I personally look up to greatly, Professor Partha Kar. It's all yours. Hello, guys. Can you hear me? Yes? Yes, yes sir, we can. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for the invite, guys. I'll, um, it's an absolute pleasure to be asked. So what I'll do is I'll start by uh, sharing my screen and getting those technicalities out of the way. And then we shall talk about, hopefully, let me know if it comes up okay, the whole slide. Does it come up? All right? Yeah. We're good? Yeah. Right. So... In my session, I've been asked to talk about, uh, you know, a bit about the future, um, scanning the horizon, so to speak, and uh, see where we are at. So I'm going to start off by a little picture. And so those of you who will have been big fans of Lord of the Rings and stuff like that. There is this concept called the Mirror of Galadriel. So if you read the, read the books or even seen the movie, this is the mirror which sort of looks into your past, your present, but most importantly, looks into the future. So, you know. Uh, the elves tell Frodo and his companion, Sam, as to what will happen to them, where they will go, etc. So this is very much like uh, a session where you have a quick peer, in my view at least, uh, what the future could and should look like. So what is the uh, the first question I was asked, uh, and I'm always asked, is what's the ideal world? So people will talk to you a lot about what's the ideal world. We need to do X, Y, and Z. I mean, let's be very honest. If you've got type 1 diabetes, the ideal world is if you don't, don't have it. That's the ideal world. You know, if it doesn't, if it disappears tomorrow then that's the ideal world, you know? Uh, but uh, you all have been part of the big or the famous 10-year promise. Uh, you know, I was a, I remember many, many years ago when I was a junior doctor and uh, uh, I was told about the 10-year promise. I remember going to uh, conferences in the year 2000 and it was 10 years away, the cure for type 1 diabetes. We're still here and we're still 10 years away, so to speak. So, um, in my view, what do, you, what do I think is the essence of a long-term condition which actually uh, looks into what future care or what further things will look like? Well, it's living with it long-term. That's, I think, the fundamental thing that a lot of people who from the outside don't have type 1 diabetes probably wow. forget. Um, and I think it's, it's easy for us to sort of turn around and say, well, you should do this, you should do that. But, you know, we don't live with type 1 diabetes, as I've said in many, many sessions. I don't have it. I don't know what it is to have a hypo. I never pricked my finger in my life. Why would I? I've never taken an insulin jab in my life. Why would I? So I have no idea what it is to live with type 1 diabetes. I've read a lot of books. Um, I know a lot of theory and uh, studies, but that's about it. Uh, it's 24-7, 365 days of the year. Um, and uh, of, of those 365 days of the year, we, we as a healthcare profession probably see you twice, thrice, less so, whatever. Depends on your system. Uh, it's not Netflix, and this is something I say to my colleagues. It's not like something you go like, you know what? I not don't fancy this today, so I'm going to go and watch Amazon. So that's not what type one diabetes is about, and it's not your favorite type of burger either. It's not like you know what? I don't like the sauce in this today. I feel like not having a burger. I'm just going to have some. I don't know. I'm do, going to get some uh, chow mein today. That's not how it works. So unfortunately, it's not something you can just choose and change as you go along, and it's part of the individual. So what's the ideal world? Uh, for me, the, the planks, if you want to change things and where we are heading towards is these are the three things. And as you evolve them, this is what will change how you look after type 1 diabetes. Self-management, which is key. And all the technology we talk about, you know, whether it's Libra, whether it's uh, CGM, whether it's pumps, whether it's closed loops, it does only one thing. It helps your self-management better. And I think you go back to the example of Libra. Why is it popular? It, well, it's, it's the simple philosophy of... Um, 
why would you want to prick your fingers if there's a situation where you don't have to prick your fingers? It's as straightforward as that. It's not about necessarily about the HbA1c and the less of the high post. It's called what we say, simple plain terms, a convenience. That's what it is. Peer support, I'll talk to you about that in a minute and how important it is and access to specialists. Now, the key is access to specialists at your choice, not at the choice of the specialist. And that is probably going to be the challenge going forward as to how you do that. So in the UK, we've got a very simple strategy. At least that's what we've been trying the last four or five years. You raise the profile of type 1 diabetes, make it very uh, well known, whether you use celebrities for there is a, a fantastic see Gaurav Kapoor involved with this program and uh, that sort of thing. You need to make it like it's not doesn't have the stigma with it. You can do anything in life with type 1 diabetes. That's important to raise the profile for politicians and other people who invest money to understand. Self-management, peer support, training. And when I say training, I don't just say people living with type 1 diabetes. This is for healthcare professionals as well. There's no point in going to see a clinician who doesn't know what they're talking about. And I'm sure in your lives, you all would have um, met people who will talk to you about how you're going to prevent, how you could have prevented your type 1 diabetes when, as we all know, that's not possible. And of course, regulation which uh, still is, I would say, in a very much early stage in, in India. But in UK, we are very, very firm about looking at what regulation means. So what we are trying to get to is a culture where, but if you are not trained in certain aspects of type 1 diabetes care, you should not be doing that. You should give it to somebody who's trained or you should train yourself up. So self-management, I think this is the 21st century. So I think programs will need to be adaptable to that. You need to have mix up op mixing up options available for education. And uh, uh, Libra, as I said, is a good example of self-management whereby you can just keep an idea of what patterns you have. But there isn't one way. So in a modern world, in a 2020, when we are sitting down and we can watch movies and have food delivered to us and have a great evening just on our own. If you want a movie night or just a chill out night with your friends, you don't have to move, right? You can, you can get pizza delivered. You can catch up on a good movie. And in that sort of world, I don't think we will be able to survive much or make much progress in self-management if we keep on saying to people, you know what, to educate, you need to come to a room and sit down with me and go through lots of PowerPoint slides. That's not going to work. And it doesn't work. I can tell you from the UK data, it doesn't work. So we, and I think there's a lot of good work going on where you have to make it attractive. People's attention spans are not high in general. So you need to try and attract them with that, have online uh, and other things. So there isn't one way. now. Peer support, to me, I think is the fundamental thing. And this is what you guys are all doing. I think it's the fundamental thing of type 1 diabetes. Don't make people feel lonely. You're not alone. It's not like you're the only one with this and you're struggling with this. And that's what the fundamental of peer support is. Very, very good uh, evidence about what peer support does. And in, in, if I may say so, that actually, if you look at um, most of the data emerging, you combine good self-management tools and peer support. The question is, why do you need a clinician unless you're, you're in trouble? You don't need to go and see somebody just for the sake of it. So uh, more time to exchange ideas. Healthcare professionals to me should be guides when needed, not trying to impose their personal views as to what type one diabetes should be about. And I don't say that as somebody who does policy, I am a full on clinician. I've got lots of patients. I look after them and that's my philosophy with them. You know, you tell me there's no bad or good, so to speak. And we have had this conversation many a time with uh, patients when they talk about, um, do you know what, my uh, levels have gone up or gone down. Well, it's one of those things. There's no bad. There's, there's no bad. There's no good. There's basically, uh, yes, fantastic. You've done well to get where you are and let's try harder next time or it's just fantastic. So it, it's, it's about sort of that encouragement role. Social media is going to be a key area. And I think it is a magnificent area to spread good idea. Uh, and in these times of COVID-19, I think it becomes even more powerful, whether it's TikTok, whether it's, um, even though I appreciate in India now, TikTok does, it's not available due to uh, China and everything. But you've got Twitter, you've got Facebook, you've got all the other forums and you should use it to your advantage because it's a good way of connecting people. Group events like this, very important. Peer support. So we do something in UK and have done, and hopefully we look forward to doing that in India someday with uh, all your encouragement of all your type 1 diabetes groups. It's called TAD. It's talking about diabetes. And it's nothing. It's about four or five guys coming and talking about their type 1 diabetes. But that's not the key of the program. The key of the program is the 300 people mingling and talking to each other and exchanging ideas and all that. That's the key of the program. So uh, let people bond and challenge the status quo would be my view. So if you want to look at the future, more peer support, and more self-management. Those are the two keys, so to speak. And then obviously there is the, what I call the world of Star Trek for some many, uh, the, but it's not too far away, so to speak. Closed loops, whereby you're trying to create the artificial pancreas, do it, do it yourself. Um, 
algorithms are in place, apps are coming out, we're talking about time in range, all of these very important things. And this is again, driving one thing. Think of it this way. If you've got a standardized process, so DIY, which is do it yourself, AP has obviously come under criticism quite understandably from a lot of people in the industry and from clinicians saying it may not be safe where patients are doing it. But as I, as I keep interacting with the type one community who have done this, as they, and, and they keep saying to me a very important thing, if I wanted to harm myself, if that's what you're worried about, well, I've got insulin. I can harm myself quicker with this. Why would I want to go through a complicated algorithm to do that to myself? Which is true. And uh, I think it's not for us to judge people. It's about the regulatory body. But what it has done uh, quite phenomenally is pushed industry to look into this area. Now what you have is that you've got closed loops coming from Tandem. You've got Medtronic. You've got everybody else following up, Omnipod. So this is the business which is going to be in town. And I think for a healthcare professional, the message has to be is to train up because... You need to know what this is and you should not stop, you, you know, you should not be a barrier to people getting it. So I think that would be an important thing. Um, so it's, and I think it's important to say, this is what is called disruptive innovation. It's not cure, but it's as close to it with your closed pancreas when you worry less about it. And I think that's the thing, self-management. And we always have this debate is that, and I'll give you one example. People talk about psychological support in type one diabetes. And you'll hear a lot of debate, but it doesn't improve your HbA1c. The thing is, if you look at it, if you take it one step forward and if you look at diabetes as a whole, we do spend a lot of money in internationally about we would like to reduce amputation. If you ask people, why do you want to do that? The main thing that's always because you improve your quality of life. So we can't have the same argument in different quarters to fit ourselves. If quality of life improvement is the main thing, then you try and give people the tools where they can manage their quality of life better. It's just very, very simple of that. And that's been the fundamental why we have driven Libra. The, the, the added benefits that we have had about improvement in HbA1c or reduction in hospital admissions comes, well, that's just comes with it. You know, if you improve your quality of life and you're happy, you achieve more. Um, and that's doesn't have, you don't have to have type 1 diabetes for that. It's you be chilled in life and you've got less worries about everything else, you do better. And that's that's the fundamental of this. So a couple of last things to, a few last few things to mention. I think the important thing also in the aspect of all, this is where I think all you guys come in, uh, the widening gap. This should not become that, you know, it should not become the battle of the haves and the have-nots. You know, we're in a world whereby COVID-19 has opened up a very interesting people uh, situation where people who have a lot of money uh, don't know how to spend it. And people who don't have a lot of money uh, don't know how to earn it. So we need to be very careful that all this technology is not doesn't just get uh, honed into people who are who have got the wherewithal to do it. And this is where healthcare professionals, or indeed yourselves as uh, groups as you are, um, you know, try and help those who are not as fortunate as you. Maybe a lot of you, um, a lot of people don't have access to computers and all that, so they may not be joining this. They may not be seeing this. How do you help people? Sometimes it's basic things like making sure they have got their insulin and. I must make a note of or make a point about, and I know they're one of the groups in Uran and uh, I, what Dr. Sharda and everybody does is absolutely Archana does it absolutely amazing. You know, that we need more of that. Um, uh, you know, Bunchi is involved with diabetes care. And again, I'm, I'm always impressed with people who do that. Um, there is always a criticism that comes hand in hand with that when you try and do something when people believe that you might be doing it because you want to earn a lot of, I don't know, kudos and name. I don't know, um, uh, beyond Mother Teresa, I haven't actually met anybody who does everything just because they want to do it. Some people do, but a lot of people, and having kudos is not a bad thing. That's what social media is all about, right? Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, we put our stuff up and we always like it when people like it. People like, like being appreciated. There's nothing wrong in that. I think the important thing is to step out and do it. I would rather have people step up and help the type one community as healthcare professionals, even though they might have a motive behind it rather than sit back and criticize it from their armchairs. So that's important. And I think that's where you guys, as people living with type 1 diabetes, need to sort of uh, have your healthcare professional encourage them to do so. And with people like Banshi and Archana, uh, Sanjay, Kalra and others, you know, I'm pretty sure there's a good cohort of people building up who will do that. Can, it, can the whole type 1 diabetes agenda be drowned in noise around type 2 diabetes and prevention? I go back to the point about raising the profile, and that's important, very important. In our country, uh, having Theresa May, a uh, prime minister, having type 1 diabetes was important. It was important to show, first of all, type 1 diabetes is not a barrier. Secondly, you can become the top leader of the country. And thirdly, there was no stigma. You know, She did her work. She had her insulin. It was quite straightforward. 
Cost is important and I train physicians obviously is an issue which you need to have people who know what they're doing with type 1 diabetes. So we are working uh, with obviously a couple of the uh, type 1 diabetes groups such as diabetes as well as Bunchy and others, Archana is involved as well, trying to create something which hopefully will improve that. So to me, I think the key is all of you and I think I pause at this moment and say a massive, massive amount of congratulations and kudos to all of you. You know, I know in diabetes, you got uh, Jazz, obviously, uh, Pragya, uh, you got Indu, uh, from uh, Dia, you got Apurva, Sahil, uh, Blue Circle, Nupur, uh, obviously Uran, diabetes, and then diabetes awareness and you. So all of you who have done all this work, I mean, huge, huge congrats for doing this. You should do more of this. Why not? You know, and I think there is that view about raising the issue and this is what you do. Um, there will always be, um, you know, you have to work together to achieve something. And as I'll give you an example in life about sexism or racism or misogyny, um, experiences, uh, some people face so hard. So let's take the example of sexism. Um, I'm a big believer in equal, you know, everybody's equal, doesn't matter. But, you know, some people have had such a horrendous experience with that with men. For them, you know, no men can be an ally. Uh, but at the same time, you know, there are a lot of men who want to be allies, right? That is why we have this he for she campaign we have got in India. They got something done by Farhan Akhtar, as far as I remember, called Mard. And there are many allies behind. Type 1 diabetes is the same. Some patients experience with healthcare professionals might have been so bad, so poor, that they cannot think that healthcare professionals can work with you. Um, I think it's about broadening the mind and believing that healthcare professionals also can help. We're very happy to take a backseat. I'm very happy not to have any of the names anywhere involved, but happy to help where it's possible because we do have a passion to improve type 1 diabetes care as well. So I think that's important. I would challenge the system because the stronger your voice is, the more it is. And that goes hand in hand with challenging industry. It's not just the role of industry to put out new things and not look at pricing. That's what we've done here in the UK. We've made or asked Abbott to drop their pricing so it was more accessible. And that's how we get so many people on devices. You know, cost is an issue. And I think we need to bear that in mind. So I'll finish with this. And I think it's a very important lesson that I say to most people. Uh, and it's not about what we deserve. It's about what we believe. We can all, we all feel that, you know, we deserve to be X, Y, and Z, but, you know, it's about believing in it and working together to achieving it. So as far as I'm concerned, a quick peek into the future does involve, you know, more self-management tools online, more fun way of doing it, greater peer support as you're already encouraging using all your platforms you can. Don't forget, don't lose sight of those who are not as fortunate probably as yourselves. And I think the third bit is about healthcare professionals access, which is something that we are quite keen to work on as healthcare professionals ourselves in the type one diabetes field to try and help plug that angle. The other two is very much in your domain to do so. So I'll, I'll finish with that. And hopefully that's a very quick run through as to where we are and what's happening. But as I said, you know, congratulations to all involved in this conference. It's been pretty amazing to be a part of it. And uh, thank you to all concerned. Very humble to be asked, much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, <clears throat> Dr. Prathakar. We have a few questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. um, one is, when is the cure coming? So the cure is always 10 years away, right? Um, <laughs> and now if you look at evidence and science that is going through, so some exciting work is going on in San Francisco uh, called Viasite, which looks at stem cells. Again, very early doors. But what I do not want to do is I can go through a, a, a run of trials which are out there, JDRF putting in money and et cetera. I think I'm, I'm less keen to do so because what I don't want to do is raise false hope because I think that's been given to many people with type 1 diabetes so many times. I would rather say to the type 1 community, focus on the things that you can do better right now rather than putting your hope on something which may never arise. And I think that's important to realize. You know, we may not be able to solve it, right? We may be able to keep, able to keep it at bay. And that's what, for example, the HIV community, you know, there's no cure, but you can keep it at bay. And I think that's the important sort of message with any immune condition seen there. There is another question um, that I think touches towards your point of access to a specialist, but it says, hi, <clears throat> I want to try a pump, but my doctor is discouraging me to do so. What should I do? Find a new doctor is the simplest advice I can give you. And this is what I say to everybody with type 1 diabetes. It is not complicated. So don't forget why the doctor is not doing so. It's not because, could be, maybe he, uh, you know, let's be, uh, let's be honest. Not all of us are trained in everything, right? I don't know everything about type 1 diabetes. This is why I've got a team, right? I work with a gentleman called Ian Cranston, who is absolutely brilliant in all technology. I let him handle the pumps, right? I know what it is. I'll direct him towards it. 
So don't forget, lots of people don't know what a pumped will do. They don't know how to manage it themselves. They will get scared that, oh, does it show it up that I don't know what to do with this? So I think in that case, find somebody who uh, can do it. So uh, that's as straightforward as that. Sahil, do you have anything to ask before I go to the rapid fire? Uh, yeah. Sahil, how's the muscles, man? <laughs> I'm doing good, sir. How are you? Okay. I'm good. I'm good. So, Thank you. Yeah, I have a quick question. Uh, you discussed about uh, the closed loop, uh, the DIY. So mm -hmm. how do you see uh, all those things coming to India in the future? Like, of course, we have things in Europe yeah. and US. But yeah, so I think India is a very evolving space. I think over the, I must say over the last four or five years, there's been a huge acceleration of knowledge about type. And I think this is why I go back to the raising the profile. And industry also, right. also mapped this because if there's no noise around type 1 diabetes, why will a company come and invest in your country, right? Yeah. They're looking at countries where there's a lot of noise, like the UK and US and Europe. On the other hand, what you guys are doing, you can see suddenly people like Dexcom and Medtronic getting more at the end of the day without any disrespect to them. And that's no fault of that's what they do. You know, they have to raise money and that's their business. Okay. They will invest in a country which has got people. So I think the more you raise the noise, the more you interact with Dexcom, Medtronic, Omnipod, the more they'll be interested to come. And I think these are all good examples of doing so. So I would encourage okay. more of this. That's what will bring them through to you faster. Okay, great. One more question. Uh, as you uh, explained about uh, time in range in Ahmedabad conference, I remember I attended that. So in India still, uh, like 90% of the people, they just uh, blindly follow the HbA1c. Yeah. Whether they have uh, more hypos, hyper, yeah. but the average comes better. So yeah. how do you want to take that thing on time in range? Because people don't actually focus on that. They focus on HbA1c. So first of all, let me assure you, it's the same in the UK, right? Okay. The majority of people still are doing finger pricks or nothing at all. Or, uh, you know, the, just to give you an idea, there is a lot of belief out there in India that in UK, everything is fantastic. I can assure you it is not. Okay. Right. We just have better data to tell you what we are at. Okay. So the average number of uh, finger pricking that's going on in this country is about two a day. Okay. okay. Right. That's the national data. So it's not like people are running around with what you what we see on social media is a very small percentage of people. I think people forget that, right? Exactly. So yeah. it's the same. It's the same here. And I, as I always say, time in range is a fantastic concept to engage with people. But that goes hand in hand with having the devices to do see, uh, the time in range. Correct. Because you can do time in range with blood glucose strips. But that means you'll have to check yourself 20 times a day, right? right. Which is right. pretty difficult to do. So that's the, it's the chicken and egg. I, I'm very happy for people to focus on, I think goes back to the affordability. So some people will not be able to do it, right? And that's Sorry. fine. You go with HP one c and you go and make sure they're safe and et cetera. So that I think is a bit far away, but it's, it's a concept whereby, again, it goes back to your earlier question. So it's like, it's like they're all interconnected. You want companies to come more to give you devices so you can do time in range. We'll raise the profile, do the work, you will come there and thereby the access will spread. Correct. So I think we need to make a lot of, a lot of more uh, noise in India with the conferences and stuff. No, you're doing, I mean, as I said, you're doing, you guys are doing really good work. You know, I think it's fantastic to see all your organizations coming together and having this loose alliance of working to, as it should be. The same happens in the UK. There's not going to be one particular way of doing it, right? Because personalities and, you know, I come from India. The, the difference between somebody who comes from Bengal and somebody who comes from, you know, I don't know, from Karnataka is pretty much chalk and cheese, <laughs> right? You know, so that's normal for to have different groups. Yeah. That's fine. That's not okay. a problem. Keep working. Okay, so before we go on to the next speaker, a very quick, fun, rapid fire round for you. Mm -hmm. SLR, just uh, quick answers. Okay. Mm -hmm. Favorite Bollywood actor? Shah Rukh Khan. Okay. Food or sleep? Food. If endocrinology was an emoji? Smiley face. <laughs> okay. In, uh, Instagram or Facebook? Facebook. Facebook or Twitter? Twitter. Stupid question. <laughs> jalebi or gulab jamun? Oh, jalebi. Books or movies? And you can't say comics. Movies. iOS or Android? Oh, iOS. Definitely Apple. And finally, pancakes or waffles? Pancakes. Amazing. And that, um, thank you for taking up the time to do this. Really appreciate it. Pleasure. And, um, thank you so much, sir. Thank you. I think we move on to the next speaker now. Yeah. Our next speaker is Sarah McLeod. And um, 
Sarah has been living with type 1 diabetes since 2005. For many years, she struggled with depression, diabetes, burnout, and disordered eating. Uh, she enjoys advocating for and empowering those who live with diabetes, especially women with diabetes, and helps others explore their own journey towards holistic health and their high self through her platform, which is called Grace and Growth, um, which places an emphasis on spiritual wellness for women with type 1. So with that, uh, let's have Sarah on, who will be talking about type 1 diabetes burnout, recognition, and resolution. Sarah, welcome to Connect One. I think you're muted, yeah. Hello. Hey, everybody. <laughs> How Hi, are you? you? Good, everyone can hear me fine. Perfect. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. Um, this is so exciting. It's it's nice and early where I am. So um, I unfortunately had to miss out on some of the other amazing um, speakers and sessions, but I'm hoping to, to catch up on what I missed. And I'm just grateful to have this opportunity. So thank you. It's all yours. Um, Go ahead. Like Jazz said, I've been living um, with type one um, since I was 15. So I'm gonna share my screen here. We'll get this going on here for you guys. All righty. Let's see here. I'll do this. Mm -hmm. Sorry guys, make sure this gets going. Oh, of course. These are, the, these are the conference nerves here. <laughs> I never open it up from this one. So I got to thank you guys for bearing with me for just a second. How do I get this going on? We had a couple of glitches earlier on and we just said that those are the hypos and hypers of technology. Yes. And you know, what's funny is usually like it's in the keynote um, for me. And then this is just in my email. So I didn't, um, I thought I was ahead of the game here. So let me open. Uh, I just want to make sure. Sorry, guys. You guys are awesome. Okay, let me just go one more screen here. Dun, dun, dun. Okay. You know what? Do we have it? I, I have it right here. I just don't know how to make it um, get big for for everyone else to see here. So um, I just have like uh, a preview. Here. Sarah, there's yes. an option uh, of share screen. Can you oh, okay, you guys can't even see it yet. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You just share that and we can see your screen then. Okay. So this uh, is, yeah, yeah I now. just, I'm just having a hard time getting this to get a little bit bigger. So I didn't want it to have like my whole browser viewed, but um, okay. The, we'll just, we'll just move through it in this way. Cause you guys can all still that see works. this. That so. Yeah. Yeah, we'll roll with it. And this is what it's all about, right? As I'm like getting sweatier and stuff here. I'm like, no. Okay. So we're going to move right along into this diabetes burnout presentation. So so diabetes burnout, maybe it's something that you um, personally have struggled with. Maybe it's something that you're not sure if you've struggled with. And that might be because diabetes burnout can, can look a little bit different for everybody. And, and what happens um, when we're experiencing diabetes burnout is that um, we're feeling overwhelmed and exhausted by the daily management of, of type 1 diabetes or any kind of diabetes. Um, and so... Diabetes burnout, like I said, can look a little bit different for everyone. Um, it can look like maybe feeling isolated or alone. It can look like avoiding some of your management routines. Um, it can also maybe look like feeling like you're controlled um, by your diabetes. And um, oftentimes people that are experiencing diabetes burnout are also holding on to negative emotions surrounding life with diabetes. So. So kind of going a little bit more into that, um, you know, I was diagnosed um, as, a, as a freshman in high school. I was 15 years old. And unfortunately, um, you know, for me, I guess, unfortunately, but also fortunately, there's nobody else in my family that is living with diabetes. So for me, it was really something that was brand new. Um, and I, I had to, to learn um, everything myself. And there was really no one to help guide me. Um, it, it, within my family. And I also didn't have any peers. And so I felt very isolated and alone. And personally for me, I was also an athlete growing up. So I played uh, soccer. I was a competitive soccer player. I was actually a goalkeeper. So there was a lot of, you know, different things going on for me um, where I felt like um, 
you know, maybe I wasn't getting that sub where I could hop off the field and check my blood sugar. I was having to stay on the field for the entire game. And, and sometimes I would just feel like, you know, nobody else has to do this. I'm the only one on this team that has to work so hard um, just to, to be healthy enough to step onto the field. Um, and also, you know, within my own family dynamics, you know, having, having two brothers that were, you know, quote unquote healthy, um, Whereas I was like, you know, why do I have to do all these chores too? I, I have diabetes and, you know, I have a low and I have a high. And <laughs> so, you know, just feeling isolated and alone um, and, and comparing yourself to others, which, you know, we know how um, that can be with any other area of life too. Like we don't really want to be comparing ourselves to other people. You know, we have to, to live our own life. And so with diabetes burnout, um, maybe you start to avoid some of your uh, management routines. So, you know, sometimes we fall into patterns of not checking our blood sugar as often as we can. Um, and, and of course, there are so many other reasons why we might not be checking as often. Maybe that's because um, of an access issue. Maybe we don't have access to um, as many test strips as we would like, or, or maybe we don't have access to some of the different technologies. So, you know, it, when we don't have an insulin pump um, and, and we're using um, multiple daily injections to manage our diabetes, you know, that leaves um, a greater opportunity maybe for those missed doses. Whereas, you know, people that have access to the technology, they've got their pump right on their side, um, like I do now. And and that's not to say that even if you are wearing a pump or wearing um, a CGM that you're not um, maybe choosing to be less mindful of your diabetes during that period of burnout. And so another reason why people fall into diabetes burnout is because that they're, they're feeling like they're just controlled by their diabetes. Um, and this can become very frustrating and um, it starts to transform from a feeling of maybe distress um, into that state of burnout. So um, sometimes you'll hear some people talk about diabetes distress versus diabetes burnout. And it's my understanding that, you know, distress is something that happens uh, periodically. Um, it's a, you know, a period of time where you know, you're just feeling a little bit more pressure. And when distress, diabetes distress happens for prolonged period of time, for prolonged periods of time, that's when we fall into that category of burnout where we're really just exhausted. Um, we're really just fed up and, and we're filled with maybe some negative emotions surrounding diabetes and surrounding our health. So frustration and anger about having diabetes is normal, um, but when it becomes so overwhelming that you're, you're not taking care of yourself or you know, you're not enjoying life anymore because really you know, we wanna enjoy life. We wanna be um, happy, contributing members of, of our community, of our families, of society. And when we're filled with all, the, all these negative emotions like anger or sadness or frustration, um, it's, it really gets in the way of, the, of that beautiful life that is ours. So um, you know, diabetes is not an easy disease to manage. We, we know this to be true. And we do have to work hard. So, so sometimes those negative emotions start to, to build up within us. And so what, what should I do if I am experiencing diabetes burnout? Well, if you think that you might be experiencing diabetes burnout, first thing that you should do is give yourself a giant hug, a nice pat on the back because you've dropped into that mindful space where you're actually becoming aware of your actions. And I think that, you know, whether we're talking about diabetes burnout or we're talking about anything else within life, um, be, being aware is, is half the battle. Um, so many people move through their life just completely disconnected and completely unaware of, of how they feel internally and of how you know, their actions are affecting the world externally as well. And so how to overcome diabetes burnout. So for me, I went through um, long periods of diabetes burnout as a teenager and in my early 20s. And actually, you know, I'm someone that has also struggled with things like depression and anxiety and diabulimia. And, you know, I definitely took the, the hard road to, to find recovery, so to speak, and to find um, that compassionate heart that allowed me to transform my own life. But these are some of the ways um, that I really found um, help move me from that difficult place into activity and of more optimism and hope and, and health. And so first starting with just practicing self-compassion. So like I said, give yourself that pat on the back for even recognizing that maybe you're falling into a pattern of burnout. 
Um, you know, you want to open your heart and you become more aware of your own suffering. So if that suffering relates to diabetes, you know, we're becoming more aware of, of how diabetes is affecting us, you know, giving yourself that grace to be like, you know, this is a really hard thing to deal with. And, you know, I think I'm doing the best that I can, but maybe I can be doing better, right? So you, you start to learn to give yourself what you actually need. And you can also begin to recognize that you're not alone, right? So we know that we're not the only person living with diabetes, especially now that we have the internet connections of social media and all these wonderful opportunities to meet people from all around the world. And so we want to encourage ourselves to move towards that more open-minded acceptance of whatever it is that we're going through, no matter what we're going through. You know, we all are humans and we're all humans being, right? So we're, we're just being ourselves on this planet. We're living our lives and we can, we can turn that compassion towards ourselves because in the end, you know, that makes us, um, you know, better people because if we can, if we can recognize the hard things um, within life and, and give ourselves that grace, then, then suddenly we can give that same um, consideration and compassion to everyone that's around us, right? So we start to become kinder uh, people as well. And so overcoming diabetes burnout, we wanna take really small steps. So we don't wanna overwhelm ourselves because so often burnout comes from, you know, maybe doing too much. You know, maybe you're taking too much on your plate there's many aspects of life, right? We have our, our families, our relationships with friends and, and, and our partner maybe, and um, you know, coworkers, and we have our physical activity and we have you know, our creativity and we have our spiritual, spirituality. We have um, all these other different categories as well, um, our career, um, our education. And you know, there's a lot of demands on us. So when you add another demand, like managing a chronic illness, well, it is a job that we are not getting paid for, unfortunately. Um, and many of us are paying a lot to, to manage this disease as well. I, I would say all of us are paying, you know, more than we, than we should have to, I would say. So, you know, nobody expects you to be perfect. You don't have to do it all. Um, but what you do have to do is your diabetes. So that's where we start. We need to really prioritize our health. So when we can get our body feeling good, um, that's when we can start to work on things like our spirit and our mind. And, you know, that's what leads us to that higher evolution of, of who we will become. So, you know, no one expects you to be perfect. Whatever your goal might be, you want to start to identify specific things that you can do in the here and now. So thinking about the present moment, you know, not thinking about next week or, or next month or next year. And, and although, you know, having those visions and having those goals is very important, um, you know, trying to stay within that present moment, what can you do today? And, and maybe that's like, well, in this moment, yes, I think I can check my blood sugar. And in this moment, I think that I can, you know, take that shot for that meal, you know, not thinking about that whole day of insulin or that whole, you know, day of having to check, but just staying within the present moment. And lastly, um, a great way to overcome diabetes burnout is by finding some support because knowing you're not alone is one of the most important things. So talking about how we feel can help. And whether you're talking about that with somebody that has diabetes or somebody that's just showing you that sense of um, you know, empathy just because you're another human being and you're going through something difficult. Um, you're going through something that, that places a lot of demand on you physically, mentally, emotionally. And so, you know, maybe you're talking to a, a loved one, even if they don't have diabetes, maybe you're talking to, um, you know, a healthcare professional, like a therapist, or, you know, now they have some, you know, great apps where you can hop online and you can speak with a therapist, but maybe what you're doing is you're diving into that beautiful world of community and peer support within the diabetes online community, or, the in real life community when we can all start hanging out again. So, you know, there are so many opportunities to meet other people that are living with diabetes. And, you know, if you're someone that doesn't necessarily feel as comfortable with that one-on-one -on -one interaction, um, you know, you can read blogs, you can um, follow people on Instagram, you can listen to podcasts, um, plenty of awesome diabetes books out there, definitely all sorts of ways to connect. And so I wanted to share some ways that you can cultivate self-compassion. And, and these come from a book um, called The Mindful Path to Self-Compassion. And so um, 
first one would be comforting your own body. So, you know, eating something healthy, something that you like, um, you know, taking a walk, maybe you have a dog and you can get out and take a walk with your dog um, or maybe a friends or something like that. Socially distance with a mask on right now, I guess. Um, you can lay down and just rest. Um, if you like to do yoga, you know, I love yoga. That has been really helpful um, for me during my recovery from diabulimia and diabetes burnout. Uh, yoga has allowed me to, to turn that self-compassion inward because, you know, every day it's a, it's a different conversation with this body. Um, so, you know, having, um, you know, just some kindness uh, shown to myself is, um, is so important for, for my um, my process of, of managing my diabetes. Last you can also, left. yes, thank you. Um, other things that you can do, um, you know, give yourself a little massage, um, anything that helps to improve how you feel physically. You can also write a letter to yourself. So just taking some time to acknowledge how you're feeling without blaming yourself or blaming anybody else. You offer yourself some encouragement um, and you think about what you might say to a friend that is going through what you're going through. Um, you know, speak to yourself with that same kindness that you would say um, to your friend. And maybe you'd be a little, a little harsh to your friend, but you know, <laughs> Maybe we try to see, you know, what are the nice things that we can say to ourselves? Um, so you direct those compassionate responses towards yourself. And then last um, suggestion would be to practice mindfulness. So the non-judgmental observation of your own thoughts, your feelings and your actions. So not trying to deny or suppress them, but, you know, really just like taking a look in that mirror. And even if you don't like what you see, you know, just accepting the good with the bad, with that compassionate attitude, because, you know, like I said, we're all humans being, right? So this is this is our life. And um, I'm actually reading a book right now. This is the last thing I'll say because I know I'm, I'm running out of time. It's called Burning Bright. Um, and this author is talking about um, burnout, not diabetes related, but just life in, in general. And she says, burning bright is the opposite of burning out. Burnout comes from excessive relentless doing, but the beauty of burning bright is that it is not about do, doing anything more at all. And so just thinking about that, remembering you already have what it is, what it takes to, to move past diabetes burnout within you. You know, it's not about adding anything else into your life, but it's about turning inward and recognizing that you can burn bright as you are here and now, and that we're all here to support you, all your, your type one diabetes friends and family. Um, we're here for you. So yeah, thanks guys. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you, Sarah. That was Wonderful. And before we get into any questions, I'm just going to request Sahil to quickly summarize that for our non-English speaking audience. So if you can just summarize that in Hindi, Sahil, that'll be great. Yes, sure. Thank you, Sarah, for sharing uh, insights on such important topics. Uh, I will just explain our Indian, Indian audience uh, in Hindi. So, we have talked about Sarah has talked about diabetes burnout. Ke bar mein. So burnout is a state, a जो आपकी फीलिंग है व्हेन जब आप डायबिटीज के साथ डेली इंजेक्शंस ले रहे हो उसको मैनेज कर रहे हो देन यू फील आपको ऐसा और ये आई थिंक मुझे ऐसा लगता है कि इंडिया में ऑलमोस्ट जितने भी डायबिटिक्स uh, हैं वो कभी ना कभी सिचुएशन से गए हैं सबकी लाइफ में वो फेज आया कि अब मुझे लग रहा है कि मैं डायबिटीज मैनेज नहीं कर पाऊंगा मैं रोज इंजेक्शंस नहीं ले पा रहा हूं मुझे uh, और इतने सारे काम है कि बहुत ज्यादा प्रेशर हो रहा है डायबिटीज को मैनेज करने में कई बार आसपास जो आपके लोग हैं वो आपको बोलते हैं कि अच्छा तू हर वक्त डायबिटीज ही मैनेज करता रहता है बस शुगर ही चेक करता रहता है सो so, हमें पता है उसके इंपॉर्टेंस कितनी है हमारी लाइफ में बट कई बार ऐसा होगा कि आपके आसपास जो लोग हैं वो उस चीज को नहीं समझ पाएंगे और वो भी एक प्रेशर बनेगा आपके ऊपर सो so, ये सब रिलेटेड टू डायबिटीज बर्न आउट सो ये कंडीशन है जो हमें कई मेरे साथ भी ऐसा कई बार हुआ है कि कुछ फेज ऐसा आता है जब मुझे काम का प्रेशर बहुत ज्यादा है कि मैं डायबिटीज अच्छे से मैनेज नहीं कर पाता सो दैट इज अ फेज जहां पे मुझे लगता है कि यार बस ये ये मुझे क्यों हो गया सो देर आर फेजेस लाइक दैट ऐसा भी चीजें होंगी बट आपको जब आपको ये हो सबसे पहले तो आपको ये एक्सेप्ट करना है कि आपको ऐसा फील हो रहा है एंड देन आपके पास बहुत सारे ऑप्शन है जो आप आगे कर सकते हो सो so, उस टाइम पे सबसे पहले सबसे ज्यादा इंपॉर्टेंस देनी है अपनी हेल्थ को अपने डायबिटीज मैनेजमेंट को एंड देन उसके बाद जिस चीज में आप कंफर्टेबल हो रीच अ टाइप वन फ्रेंड या फिर uh, किसी कम्युनिटी में आप बात करो 
जो हमारे इंडिया में बहुत सारी है जहां भी आपको अच्छा लगे जहां पे आप शेयर कर सकते हो अपने पेरेंट्स के साथ सो जब आप उन लोगों के साथ शेयर करोगे कि आपको प्रॉब्लम क्या है सो पहले तो आपके अंदर जो चीजें फिल हो रही है बिकॉज ऑफ जो आप मैनेज करे हो डायबिटीज उसकी वजह से वो चीजें क्लियर होंगी एंड देन पीपल जो आपके आसपास लोग हैं वो आपको सपोर्ट कर पाएंगे बिकॉज जब तक आप उनको समझाओगे नहीं उनको समझ नहीं आएगा जो कि डायबिटिक नहीं है तो सबसे इंपॉर्टेंट यह है कि आप एक्सप्रेस करो फ्रेंड्स के साथ टाइप वन के साथ कम्युनिटी के साथ आई थिंक मेरे बहुत सारे ऐसे फ्रेंड्स हैं फॉर एग्जाम्पल सारा जिसको uh, मैं ऑनलाइन ही इंस्टाग्राम पे हमारी काफी बार बात हुई एंड हमने शेयर किया अबाउट मेंटल हेल्थ और हमें कैसे अगर बर्नआउट होता है तो हमें क्या चीजें कैसे हेल्थ अपनी प्रायोरिटाइज करनी चाहिए उसे आगे रखना चाहिए सबकी लाइफ में सब काम भी जरूरी है हर चीज जरूरी है बट अगर आपकी हेल्थ सही नहीं रहेगी तो आप बाकी काम नहीं कर पाओगे ये चीज को हमें समझना पड़ेगा The first one is: Have you noticed your blood sugar levels changing if you are burnt out? Absolutely. Um, uh, the more um, the more burnout I think I'm experiencing. You know, I'm definitely seeing those higher patterns. And and also, you know, during burnout, you know, my insulin sensitivity was definitely affected. Um, and, and you know if i if i fall into patterns of burnout again which you know i'm sure i will um but luckily you know minimizing that time that you spend in burnout i think that's what our goal is it's not about completely avoiding burnout because you know like i said you have you're not perfect um but as, if we can get ourselves back um from that burnout um that's when we're going to start to see that improvement in the numbers overall and there's another question um if a person close to me so this is a person who does not have diabetes but if a person close to me is having diabetes burnout how can i help them so maybe as a caregiver i think that's an excellent question and and honestly you know um i'm someone who's very much into astrology so if you know anything about astrology you know people are very individual right so how you help someone is going to be um it's going to be different for everybody you know some people um maybe want to be left alone but but have that you know background support where they know hey listen if you need to talk i'm here for you um and that can be a really positive way of of helping that person you know some other people they might need you to do a little bit more for them you know maybe that's offering hey do you want me to help you know learn how to use your insulin pump so you know if you're feeling like you don't want to change that cartridge maybe i can help you with that and i'm saying that cuz i'm like sometimes i wish somebody would do that for me <laughs> but um you know it, diff- different things can help different people and it's about knowing that individual that that you love and that you care about and really thinking about you know the other difficult things in life how do, how do they like to be helped how do you like to be helped um and and approaching it from that individualistic perspective super Okay before we move on to the next speaker i'm going to do a quick rapid fire round with you these are just fun questions so quick answers all right so when you check your sugar like when you finger prick do you lick or do you wipe i lick you can see it every day live on <laughs> weekdays <laughs> um you last change your lancet on a year back <laughs> <laughs> this is the worst question to ask don't remember uh, Right. If anyone knew, they could, you know, it would be like the answer of a great mystery here. <laughs> wow, well, okay. All right. <laughs> Favorite hypo snack. Um right now I I've, I've adopted coconut water. So finally I like coconut water. <laughs> nice. Okay. Yeah. Jogging or hiking? Hiking. Uh puzzles or board games? Board games. <laughs> um If you had one superpower what would it be? Oh wow. Um maybe to fly. I think that would be pretty cool. I've had that dream before, you know. And lastly, you are type one of a kind because Oh, because um who else would I be? Um you know, I'm <laughs> I like a lot of weird different things. I've got a a crazy dog. I got an old dog. Um you know, who What else can I say? I I'm um I just enjoy being myself and and I definitely put myself out there. So um what you see is what you get. <laughs> That's the way. That's the way. Thank you so much Sara for spending your time you're waking up super early and joining us for the conference. It was a fantastic session and I'm sure it would have helped a lot of people listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Sara. Yeah, bye. Thank you.
All right, next up, uh, keeping on the train of mental health, we have with us today Amy. Amy was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at two years old, and she's passionate about mental health and diabetes burnout. Like Sarah, um, eating disorder recovery and diabetes psychology. And correct me if I'm wrong, Amy, but she's also right now pursuing her master's in psychology to become yes. a psychologist. So congratulations for that as well. So we have Amy with us. Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. How are you? Very well. Thank you so much for good. doing this. And thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> we have our slides ready, Rutika. So Amy is going to be speaking about unfearing the future mind over matter. Over to you, Amy. Thank you. Uh, can I go on the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so we hear a lot about the risk of complications in diabetes. And one of, if not the most common of these, is the effect that diabetes can have on our mental health and well-being. So I wanted to share some numbers about mental health and diabetes. So a quarter of the world is expected to experience a mental health problem at some point in their lives. But for people living with diabetes, this risk increases to 64% or three in five people. When talking about eating disorders and type one diabetes, over 40% of women and 10% of men will experience disordered eating and or will manipulate their insulin during their lifetime. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So when the very nature of diabetes requires an obsessive relationship with both food and numbers, and we rely upon the use of a highly effective weight management tool every single day just to stay alive, it's easy to understand why it creates the perfect storm for developing an eating disorder. These behaviors would all be considered as examples of disordered eating in an eating disorder clinic, yet in people with diabetes, most of them are a regular occurrence. So much so that disordered eating often forms a part of, dis of diabetes management. Poor mental well-being makes diabetes management that much harder, therefore increasing the risk of complications and further perpetuating a negative cycle of worry and self-doubt. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so my passion for diabetes and mental health stems from personal experience. Um, I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at two years old, so I've never known a life outside of it. Um, I first developed disordered eating behaviours when I was 12 years old, and by 13, this had developed into diabulimia, where I would avoid taking my insulin properly to control my weight. Um, this can have devastating consequences on health and the risk of diabetes complications, um, and it resulted in me nearly spending my 14th birthday in a coma. So throughout the rest of my teenage years, my eating disorder continued to worsen, transforming into anorexic behaviours and eventually into bulimia nervosa. During this time, I felt extremely burnt out with my diabetes. I didn't attend my clinic appointments and I tested my glucose levels once a week at most, figuring that it would be pointless to see the number when I already knew that it was going to be too high. So much of every day was spent consumed in numbers, my weight, how many calories I'd consumed, how many calories I'd burnt exercising, that the incessant demands of diabetes felt too much to handle on top of this. By 18 years old, I had gone from being a straight A student to a college dropout, a complete shell of the person I once was, both mentally and physically. I was anxious, depressed, self-harmed, and couldn't see a way out of the darkness. I eventually started treatment at a specialist eating disorder clinic and began my road to recovery. So fast forward to now at 25 years old, and recovery has taught me an awful lot. Firstly, that the road to recovery is not a straight one. Um, I've received treatment at the same eating disorder clinic on several occasions over the years since then, each time vowing that it would be the last. The truth is, you can have the best support team in the world, but recovery won't work until you believe that you deserve it for yourself. We don't get to choose the things that happen to us. I didn't choose the things that led to me developing an eating disorder, and I definitely didn't choose to be diagnosed with diabetes. But I can choose how I respond to those things and how I let them define me or not define me, as may be the case. As much as diabetes can feel like we spend our lives being defined by numbers, we really are so much more than that. Data generated by living with diabetes should be just that, just data without any emotional attachment to it, like checking the time or the directions to somewhere. 
My worst days in recovery are still far better than the, my best ones living under the wrath of an eating disorder. Recovery has enabled me to pursue things in my life that would never have been possible before, like getting my degree, soon marrying my soulmate, and now getting the opportunity to pursue my true passions for a career. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So looking to the future, where do we go next for improving mental health care for people with diabetes? Um, firstly, in my opinion, at least, we can't talk about improving mental health care outcomes until we're ready to talk about health inequalities and disparities in treatment. How can we make mental health care a priority, for, a priority in diabetes when people in the world still don't have access to affordable insulin? Only once we address this and the effect this has on mental health can we really begin to make progress. We also need much greater representation for eating disorders and mental health from all sectors of the diabetes community. There is a common misconception that eating disorders only affect white young women, which I unfortunately fit all the stereotypes of, but this really isn't the case. Maintaining this belief is incredibly harmful and creates further barriers for people who don't meet this stereotype in accessing the treatment that they need. These are the people's stories who we really need to be hearing from. We also need to improve awareness, understanding and recognition of the symptoms of diabetes distress and disordered eating, followed up by access to support and education to learn how to manage these ourselves in our own time. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to finish on a positive note. I'm sure we've all heard of all of the quotes of diabetes being the leading cause of various complications and misery and it can definitely feel like that sometimes, but diabetes has also taught me an awful lot. It's made me more compassionate, more resilient, more determined um, than I ever would have been before. And I've learned so much about myself. I've met some truly inspiring people and it's provided me with amazing opportunities like this here today. So I just want to say thank you to everyone for making this happen and also for the opportunity speaking today. Thank you, Amy. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, before I ask you any questions that we have, Sahil, would you please do the translation for our Indian audiences, please? Sure. Uh, thank you, Amy, uh, for the informative talk. I will just uh, translate in Hindi. I will try to translate in Hindi. Okay. Thank so, you. Uh, Amy, uh, ne basically, baat kiya hamare saath, uh, diabetes or eating disorders. So, disorders is avyavastha. सो uh, खाने so, की जो अव्यवस्था है जो हमारे डायबिटीज रूटीन में होती है फॉर एग्जांपल अगर हमें कोई हाइपो होता है उसके बाद हम जनरली क्या करते हैं अगर हम हमारी ब्लड शुगर सत्तर अस्सी गई हमने सब कुछ खा लिया सो so, हमने क्या किया हमने बहुत सारी कैलोरीज उठाई एज क्योंकि हमें भूख लगती है तो दैट इज वो नॉर्मल है बट हम बहुत सारी चीजें खा लेते हैं ग्लूकोज लेने की जगह या फिर uh, आप अगर कोई और शुगर जेल ले रहे हो या शुगर का घोल मिला के पीते हो तो so, उसकी जगह हम बहुत सारी चीजें चॉकलेट खा लेंगे हम लोग ब्रेड खा लेते हैं सो so, वो जो अव्यवस्था है खाने की जिससे हम एक्स्ट्रा कैलोरीज खा रहे हैं और बहुत सारी अनहेल्दी चीजें जो हम खा रहे हैं वो बेसिकली रिलेटेड है हमारे डायबिटीज और ईटिंग डिसऑर्डर के साथ तो so, उसको कैसे कंट्रोल करना है वो हमें फोकस करना पड़ता है और ये हमारी साइकोलॉजी एक बन जाती है साइकोलॉजी इन हिंदी इज मनोविज्ञान सो जब हम अपना डायबिटीज रूटीन में ट्रीट करते हैं सो so, हमें ये समझ नहीं आता कि हम हाइपो के बाद वो खाते रहते हैं और एक टाइम के बाद वो हमारी आदत बन जाती है और जिसका एक बहुत अच्छा एग्जांपल ये है कि हम हाइपो हाइपो के बाद बहुत सारी कैलोरीज खाते हैं और बहुत लोगों का बहुत सारे टाइप वन का उसकी वजह से वेट गेन होना स्टार्ट हो जाता है बिकॉज वो एक्स्ट्रा कैलोरीज खा रहे हैं चाहे वो हाइपो को ट्रीट कर रहे हैं और जो कि बहुत नॉर्मल है हाइपो में भूख लगेगी बट हमें उस चीज को कंट्रोल करना है और हमें किस चीज से उसे सही से करेक्ट करना है अपने ब्लड शुगर लेवल्स को वो हमें देखना है सो so, वो हमें उसकी जो रूटीन uh, है जो उसका खाने के साथ हमारा रिलेशनशिप है उसको कैसे हमें कंट्रोल रखना है अपने शुगर लेवल्स को भी ध्यान में रखते हुए सो दैट इज वट बेसिकली एमी ने जो हमसे भी बात करी थैंक यू साहिल फॉर दैट आई कुड नॉट है बेटर जॉब देन यू इन दैट ट्रांसलेशन डिफिकल्ट टॉपिक टू ट्रांसलेट आई मस्ट से राइट Um, Amy, we have a few questions from the audience and a few comments. Uh, one of them yep. is, "What an inspiring story," which I completely agree with. Secondly, there's a question that says, "How do you recognize that you have an eating disorder? How do you not know it's just um, not a one-off? You know, like how do you recognize that you actually have an eating disorder?" 
I think this is a really tricky thing um, to kind of establish, especially in diabetes, because so much of kind of everyday behavior with diabetes is to to someone without diabetes would be disordered anyway. Um, but I think once you kind of start to feel as though it, it might be a problem or it's causing you kind of distress or it's something that's constantly on your mind, um, I think that for me is kind of when I would take that opportunity to then think, okay, I need to address this and maybe I need to talk to someone about this. Right. And just talking about that as another question saying, if I know someone who has an eating disorder, um, yeah. how do I approach them? Um, again, this is a difficult thing because I think that is such a, a private thing for people to have. And I think a lot of people with eating disorders are very secretive about it and maybe don't want people to find out or know. But at the same time, knowing that there are people there to support you um, is so important. So I think just kind of gently approach the subject. Um, I think from personal experience, I would rather have someone ask me and maybe annoyed at them asking than have no one ask at all yeah so it's a difficult situation to be in but I think from personal experience I would definitely appreciate someone kind of taking that step to ask and lastly there's a question saying um your thoughts on body positivity and how can we actually promote a culture of body positivity and not body shaming Ooh, um, this is another difficult topic um I think also with I used to think body positivity was some kind of something that everyone should be pursuing but then I kind of realized that positivity around body is a lot harder than just body acceptance so kind of you know I, I think it's quite rare for a lot of people to say I love myself I love every part of me but kind of taking a step down from that and being able to say you know I accept myself or looking in the mirror and say okay I'm maybe not happy with this but this is who I am and I'm comfortable with that and I think kind of just taking that first step to do that very true. Um, makes the difference wow so thank you uh that was very very moving indeed thank you and um i have actually a couple of people personally messaging me right now as you were speaking saying i think i may have that so i think we've opened up some good uh, you know like pathways now that we can yeah. help out with so thank you for that and to end thank with you. a little lighter mode a quick wrap and yeah. fire yeah. round you. <laughs> yes, uh, i have a question oh, yeah. ask you. Okay. So, uh, Amy, uh, so I recently started uh, studying psychological first aid and yep. I, there were very interesting things that uh, I came to know about. So, when someone is diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, how do you think uh, there should be uh, the first psychological aid given to the patient? Because I have seen in India, there is no psychological first aid when anyone is diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. So, how do you as you have studied psychology, you're studying psychology and in your country, how do you have any uh, process for that or is it still in the development phase? Um, so I'm not actually too sure about what happens when someone's first diagnosed. Um, it was a long time ago for me now, but um, I know that in the UK, it's definitely an area that's kind of up and coming more and there's a lot more focus on it. And I know that um, kind of clinic appointments now are starting to sort of focus more on having kind of like a, a screening for mental health or a, a questionnaire kind of different sort of psychological scales um within appointments which is a really good way of doing it and I, I do think for someone first diagnosed that it's something that should kind of be offered and asked about at that very first stage and then also frequently after that kind of I don't know maybe in a month's time after first diagnosis and then periodically after that just to kind of make sure that that person is really doing okay and settling in okay but also then kind of once the honeymoon period with diabetes goes away as well so yeah no I think the point uh, you're making is very important that it's not just a follow-up for medication but it's also a follow-up yeah. for your mental state yeah yeah uh, which is a great great point okay so a quick fun rapid fire yeah you prefer fancy restaurants or local food shops oh um local local food shops local food shops uh, piercings or tattoos tattoos describe the smell of insulin in one word oh chemical good one <laughs> hypo feels like on top of the mountain or under the sea under the sea 
favorite hypo treat? Um, apple juice. Oh, it's okay. not really a treat, but. <laughs> um, glucometer or CGM? CGM. Or coffee? Coffee. What's worse, laundry or dishes? Dishes. And finally, you are type one of a kind because? Uh, I'm going to have to steal Sarah's answer for that. Um, okay. Who else would I be otherwise? <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much, Amy. It was a beautiful talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us and for all of your organizing. Of course. <laughs> Thank you. Right. We Thank move you. on to our second last speaker of the symposium. And um, we have from us uh, very early, actually, is David Mina. And he is the face behind the Instagram handle, which I'm sure a lot of you have seen, which is called Type 1 Liverbetic. He has been living with diabetes since 2008 at the age of 11. After going through a rough patch with diabetes um, at a young age, he decided to take the power back and turn it into something grand. Today, David serves the diabetic community as a content creator, graphic designer, speaker, photographer, influencer, and ambassador to various diabetes organizations. Throughout David's journey, he always keeps in mind his 11-year-old self at the time of his diagnosis and how he is becoming the person he wished he had to look up to during that time. So David, thank you so much for joining us today. I know it's very early where you are. And uh, welcome to Connect One. Hi, right, thank you so much for having me. Oh, we're very excited to hear you speak. And David, his topic today is called the social circle. How do you use social media in your type 1 diabetes journey? So David, the dais is all yours. Thank you very much. I'm just going to share my screen and I will get started. All right. So can everybody hear me well? Yep, perfect. Perfect. All right. So um, yeah, hi everyone. Thank you so much for having me. It's, it's really an honor um, and I'm really happy to be here today. I'm here to talk about the social circle with type 1 diabetes and how my journey and my experience with diabetes has formed into who I am today as type 1 livabetic on social media. So let's get started. A little backstory of who I am. Um, as I said earlier, I'm David. I've had diabetes for 11 years now since the age of 11 and I am currently a social media influencer in the diabetes space. Um, I am a Beyond Type 1 and a Life Bulb Ambassador, and I currently wear a Tandem T-Slim X2 insulin pump as well as a Dexcom G6 CGM. Along with that, who I am um, on a personal level is I'm a graphic designer, a speaker, filmer, and a digital creator overall. So a little backstory on my diagnosis. I've um, had diabetes since 2008, and it was at the age of 11, I had all the typical symptoms of, um, you know, being diagnosed as a type 1 diabetic, where I lost lots of weight. I lost about 25 pounds. I was also having this frequent thirst, frequent urination all the time. And it was just a very life-changing experience all at once, something that I had never experienced in my entire life. And I was the only child in my family to have type 1 diabetes. Um, the only person in my immediate family, especially to have type 1 diabetes. So it is a very new experience for all of us. So I'm sure many of us can relate to this, but I personally went through a rough patch with my diabetes. Um, so like I said, I was diagnosed at the age of 11. So still fairly young, still a child, um, depending on my parents a lot to care for my diabetes and to, you know, count all my carbohydrates for me and give myself injections and all of that. So at the age of 13 or 14, I started caring for myself on my own. And as a result, as a teenager, I did not care for it the best way possible. Um, at that point, I hit the highest hemoglobin A1C I had ever had in my full 11 years of living with type 1 diabetes. Um, and I would say that my highest hemoglobin A1C and my lowest point in life. Um, so I got this bad news from my endocrinologist at my three month endo appointment and they sat me down. They told me, look, we got your results. You can't keep doing this or else you're going to run into 
major health complications later on in life, such as limb amputations, vision problems, kidney problems, you name it. So right then and there, from that day forward, as soon as I left that appointment, I didn't waste a second. I began to change my ways and my lifestyle overall. And I believe that that's when my mission began as a person living and thriving with type 1 diabetes. So in all of that, I had to learn how to accept my diabetes. I had gone about three or four years without fully accepting it. I was living the day-to-day -day lifestyle as a person with diabetes, but I hadn't fully accepted it as who I really am. So this acceptance had to come from within. I had to reevaluate my whole life um, 360, and I really had to make sure that I could gain this mental clarity and fully accept my life as somebody with type 1 diabetes. And right then and there, something clicked for me. So again, maybe some of you know me on social media, but I am type 1 livabetic on Instagram. I'm just about to hit over 17,000 followers, and I've been very blessed to have this opportunity and platform in the diabetes space through social media, where I've been able to work with various brands, companies, organizations, and nonprofits. Um, this has become a lifestyle and a creative um, way of life for me. And through that, I've been able to speak, design, and create content for all these different companies and organizations. So these are just some photos of you know, me doing that work, creating, designing, and um, really just living out that social media presence as a type one diabetic. So my mission in life and as a person living with diabetes, both in person and on social media, is to show how good life can really be with type one diabetes. I had been at the lowest in my life with diabetes and now I feel like I'm at a very good place with it. And I want to show that to others, to show that you can be going through a rough patch at one point, but you can also overcome that and you can show how, how good life can be despite a chronic illness. So I want to act as that resource for people, be a positive influence and form community within the diabetes population, whether in person or online. Through this, I have been able to establish good friendships with people that I like to call diabetes, friends of mine who live with diabetes. And I've even been so blessed to have most of my friends now be all diabetic um, as a result of being so involved in this community. And through this, not only have I been able to help myself, but I've been able to help others not feel alone and other people can do the same for each other. So it's just a really great feeling overall to be so embedded in this diabetic community, in this diabetic space. So like I mentioned, community. I was craving community for several years before um, you know, I had hit that rock bottom. I probably went about seven or eight years of my life with diabetes before I met people with diabetes. I was feeling so alone, feeling like I was the only one with diabetes, and that wasn't the case. I ended up finding out that there's this huge diabetic online community, which may seem small, but it really can be really can be very big. And um, though small, it is very strong. Through this community, I have been able to form friendships with other people and see other people form their own friendships with other diabetics in this space. We all learn from each other um, and use our resources and our platforms as this outlet where we can help each other out and learn from one another beyond than what the doctors may tell us or a healthcare provider. And one thing I really want to emphasize is that we cannot do diabetes alone. We have to come together and stick with one another so that we don't feel isolated or burnt out or like we are the only ones dealing with diabetes. So through my presence on social media, I have been so very fortunate to have various speaking engagements um, like in this photo shown here, I've also been able to do creative work with different brands, diabetes um, based design projects with other companies and organizations, product photography and travel. And you'll see in this photo here last November on National Diabetes Awareness Month, I had the amazing opportunity to get my photo featured wearing a Dexcom um, on a billboard in Times Square, New York. So that was one of the highlights of my 11 years with living with type 1 diabetes. 
So just to kind of wrap up, I want to show how to live beyond diabetes, both in person and on social media. Know that life is good despite a chronic illness. Diabetes has given me so much more than it has taken from me. And that is something that I cannot stress enough. Um, I believe that working towards helping others, working towards creating this change where whether there is a cure one day for diabetes or not, we are able to live with it and we're able to live to our fullest potential with it um, and become a very strong community where we can help each other out. So I am really proud to say that I am currently in a master's program right now studying to become a certified diabetes educator as a result of my positive journey along with type 1 diabetes. And one thing I want to leave you all with is life is possible despite type 1 diabetes. Life is good, though it may seem that, you know, you're living with this chronic illness every single day. Life is possible and it can be whatever you make of it. You just have to truly want it and truly connect with others in the community to live out your full potential. So I want to thank you all so much for um, giving me this opportunity to speak with you all today. And I really hope that um, my words brought some comfort and motivation to you today. Thank you so much. Wow, thank you, David. That was amazing. Um, very, very inspirational. And uh, before I get on to the audience questions, Sahil, do you have any questions for David? Uh, hi, David. Uh, thank you hi. for sharing your journey. Uh, so I have a few questions. So as you have started from a very rough patch, then you accepted that and then overcome the situation. How, so what was, what were the steps when you, when you were going through that rough patch and then how did you accept it that like, uh, does, there were family, friends who helped at that point of time and how then how you converted now you're working in this diabetes space you are uh, studying to be a diabetes educator so how the whole transition occurred can you just give a brief of that yeah so um i think when i went through this rough patch it was just a collection of different things you know not feeling well having a really high hemoglobin a1c constantly right. having high blood sugars and at one point i just said enough is enough. I didn't want to feel this way. I didn't want to be a burden on people if I were to get sick or develop um, certain complications. So like I said, it really had to come from within. And I believe that sometimes a strong, um, you know, scare, sometimes a health scare can really shake your ground and make you put things into perspective. So once I had that experience, I realized that um, I had to take into account who am I on here on earth here for? Who do I want to help? What can I have to offer in this space? And um, that's kind of now why I'm wanting to be a diabetes educator, because I believe that my story can help so many, so many other people. And along with that, I hope that I can inspire others to um, not dwell in that rough patch, but also turn that negativity into something positive one day. Right. Uh, also, I'm one, sorry, go ahead. One, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, one point that you mentioned uh, is like you can't treat uh, diabetes alone. Like you, there is the importance of friendship, uh, social media, uh, connecting with people. So I think right now also like uh, for the last seven, eight years uh, of being a diabetic, currently I have very close friends and most of them are type 1 diabetics. So the importance of friendship and being in a community is very important, like you said. Uh, there's a question from the audience, which uh, is a very interesting question. It says that you run um, a diabetes page, which is type 1 liverbetic, um, and you have very strong social media influence. But does managing that page get stressful for you? That's a really good question. <laughs> yes. um, so yeah, it, it can be a lot of work and it can feel a little stressful or, or overwhelming at times. But um, I've kind of treated this platform as a job, as a career. Um, eventually, yeah, I want to become a diabetes educator. So my work will all be based with diabetes. So I find that, you know, just like any other job, it's going to be stressful, it's going to be busy. But at the end of the day, this is my area of work and I need to show up every day and provide. Um, and then when it gets tough, I remind myself of two things. First, I remember, 
what I was like when I was 11 years old, newly diagnosed, scared, um, confused. And I remember that I need to continue doing what I'm doing for that 11 year old self. Um, and second, I want to, I always remind myself of the good that has come out of it. So I need to continue to do that um, and hopefully help more people than I have already done. Amazing. All right. So uh, before we move on to the last speaker, a quick rapid fire round for you as well. Um, your favorite musician? Ariana Grande. Ooh, <laughs> nice. Okay. Favorite hypo snack? Um, apple juice. Apple juice. I like orange juice. Why does no one like orange juice? <laughs> um, dogs or cats? Dogs. You have a dog, don't you? I did. He, he did pass away not too oh. long ago, but I did have a dog. <laughs> Yeah. Um, if type 1 diabetes was an emoji? The crying emoji. <laughs> <laughs> um, favorite Disney character? Um, Mickey Mouse. Classic. Books or movies? Movies. Library or museum? Museum. YouTube or Instagram? Instagram. And finally, you are type one of a kind because? Because I am capable. I'm capable of doing diabetes. Amazing. Wow. Super. That was amazing. So guys, uh, anyone who's watching, go check out type one Liverbetic on Instagram. He has some great content. And thank you, David, for that amazing talk. And thank you for coming to our conference. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we are almost at the end. Our last two speakers who are presenting together, um, Chavi Chadda and Snehal. Um, and uh, they both are from Blue Circle Diabetes Foundation. And since we are talking about mental health, they are going to be talking about the importance of community in mental health. So Chavi is a content marketer and a strategist by profession, type 1 diabetic since 2014, enjoys a good cup of tea and reading. And she's the content head and Delhi chapter lead at Blue Circle Diabetes Foundation. Snehal is an IT analyst by profession, Mumbai chapter lead at Blue Circle, and type 1 diabetic since 18 years. Loves reading, dancing, and listening to music. And they are going to be talking about connecting through the community. So Snehal and Chavi, please, the dice is all yours. So much, uh, uh, can I just uh, start sharing my screen and then I think we can start with the presentation. Yeah, is my screen visible now? Yes, it's good to go. Okay, yeah. Uh, so uh, I would, before I start with our topic, I would definitely like to thank Jazz, uh, the entire team of Diabetes, and the entire organizing committee uh, for the Connect One conference for giving us this opportunity uh, to talk about the importance of uh, connecting to T1D community. And I think the entire, uh, the last symposium has been uh, like the talking about the same thing the importance of community and why it is important to be connected. And I think our session will sort of uh, summarize the entire last symposium of it. Uh, so I have with me Chavi. Hi. Yeah. So uh, me and Chavi will be talk walking you through uh, our topic today. Uh, so uh, I have been uh, type 1 diabetic since 18 long years and I was diagnosed when I was 11 years old. And when I look back at my journey as a T1D, it has been a really long, uh, chaotic, confusing, uh, with literally with all its ups and downs. So I covered my schooling, uh, my junior college, my degree college, and my work life. Uh, along with all of this, managing uh, my sugar uh, and diabetes management along with it. So I think as a child, when you're diagnosed, there's a lot of confusion because first of all, you are not aware of what is going around with you, what is happening with your body, what the doctor is talking about and what your parents are undergoing too because uh, there were moments when I saw my parents crying when they had to inject me with uh, insulin, right? And uh, so when I was diagnosed, I did not have any type 1 friends as such and I was never aware of this concept of a type 1 community. And when I was in college, uh, I came across the local T1D community and I have to say that had been a tremendous help to me uh, in managing my diabetes in a much, much better way. 
uh, and as a child and also as a teenage i think uh, the uh, important factor for me to understand and realize the importance of was food habits so when you're young and you see a lot of your friends eating chocolates and you are denied having chocolates so it sort of becomes that forbidden uh, thing that you always crave for but when i had my other t1d friends and i saw how they were managing in a much better way i think that really helped uh, my mind to calm myself down and uh, understand that i am not alone in this battle and there are a lot of other friends and other people who are going through the same things as i am and i'm sure chavi will agree with me yeah so um, i'm just going to say i was diagnosed in 2014 as an adult and uh, it was sort of assumed that you know it would have been easier for me because um, you know i'm the decision maker so to speak so it will be easier for me to check sugars or take insulin or you know talk to peers at workplace uh, but let me tell you that's not how it works um for over two years i kind of struggled to even you know find myself understanding what this journey is i have the best of friends i have the bestest of parents and siblings and yet um, nobody really understood my journey so i i think for me just like snehal finding the community has been a game changer in the sense that um everything that i need to do to manage my diabetes it becomes so much more easier because i know there's somebody out there who is living a journey similar to mine so definitely um just to sum up yes um, adult diagnosis or child diagnosis uh, the journey without the community is is tough definitely uh, so i also uh, right now everyone is in a very uncertain phase Also, oh, you're just there's a slide. So these are here. yeah, yeah. So these are a couple of pictures that we have um, from our favorite moments uh, within the community. Uh, so you see on the left, that's the um, dia meet we had in uh, Bombay, and um, on the other side, uh, from my first visit to Pune, uh, when I met all these people from Blue Circle, um, and then we have the calendar shoot that we did in December. Um, so yeah, lovely moments, and um, it's amazing. Snippets of uh, like meeting the community, and uh, you can definitely see how everyone has smiling faces here. Uh, so moving on to the next part of our discussion is uh, the lockdown period. So I know that this lockdown has been a very uncertain time for everyone, and it did not come with a manual like how you're supposed to behave or what the future is or what the present is. And there's been a lot of of uh, chaos, confusion, or uh, stress, anger, frustration, all sort of emotions. or uh, regarding to everything like how we are going to deal with the future or if i am going to get a, a, a positive on my report or not yeah um and i'm i'm just going to add to this that while uh, you know the lockdown has amplified all these uncertainties and anxieties and um of course um add to that an invisible chronic condition like diabetes oh my god oh <laughs> it's been hard uh, but um i'll just say this that you know for example for me at least i can say that um i need to have an active lifestyle to manage my diabetes period um but uh, remote working adds pressures and all those things how do i explain it to my peers at work um snehal talking to her it's so much easier because i know there's somebody out there who's uh, dealing with it um also just going to add this one point um we are working professionals there are kids who are worried about their future there are younger people who uh, the older people who are worried about you know their routines being taken away so yes it's uncertain but yes the problems that each phase age group is facing in this lockdown is different and yet for all the diabetics it's similar because uh, you know the underlying chronic condition kind of takes the toll and its management takes the toll and when the lockdown like in india it's been somewhere uh, from mid march and we started receiving a lot of calls from the community members and here on the slide you can see uh, like uh, one of the calls that i received uh, through a, a t1d friend uh, who was stressed about uh, the work life and i'm sure this is something that everyone uh, who are like working professionals are going through because we don't know if the company is going to lay off of people uh, there are no increments there are no appraisals salaries have been cut down and i could definitely relate with it because uh, there was a sort of similar situation that i was going through in my workplace and uh, when we came across such questions from the community members uh, we sort of started thinking on how we as a community can help and give back to the 
uh, community who are being stressed or anxious about these things. Uh, so that's when we sat down, we brainstormed the idea and uh, we came up uh, with this uh, idea that we can start something called as the Blue Circle Buddy Project. And I'll let Chavi talk about it more. Yeah, so um, personally, as a part of this community, there are a lot of projects that we've launched at Blue Circle. Um, there's Project Gaia that I think Sneha Nupur, we're very, very proud to be a part of, which is about, um, which is specially focused at women um, who live with diabetes. But this buddy project is something that's uh, that comes a close second. Um, and so basically, just as Professor Partha said, you know, peer support is extremely important. And that while he feels it would be the future, we're just really proud that we're taking small baby steps to uh, bring it here uh, in the present. So basically with um, Blue Circle Buddy Project, what we're doing is it's an online psychosocial helpline for um, type 1 diabetics currently living in India. So we have uh, 13 diabetes who speak eight regional languages, Indian regional languages, and we've been trained by Center for Mental Health Law Policy um, and Chelaram Diabetes Institute. Um, I'll also give a disclaimer here that we're not mental health professionals. We're nowhere claiming to be those. And that's exactly what um, is the USP of this whole thing. Um, we are just your peers who exactly understand what you're going through. So any mental anxiety, stress that you feel during this lockdown because it's hard um there are 13 buddies on here um you can log on you can i think snail is going to share the link in the chat box um you can um log on you can book a session with us it's really that simple um in the in just the hope that you know um in moments that become too hard for you you're able to find support system um with with all of us as Chavi said, uh, we are uh, trained to deal with uh, mental health as well as diabetes management issues. And um, uh, so I'll just walk you through the registration or like how you can schedule a call with a dia buddy. So I'll share the link with you all. And once you go on the link, uh, there will be a profile page of all the 13 dia buddies and like a small bio of each one of them. And it also mentions the languages that the buddies can talk. So uh, you can just go on to that page, uh, read the bios through and uh, select a buddy uh, with whom you feel comfortable to talk to. And uh, 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 we have received numerous calls uh, since the lockdown has started and we have initiated this pro project. Uh, and our buddies have spent considerable amount of time uh, sort of counseling and helping people release mm -hmm. uh, their stress and uh, definitely calming their anxiety in a, in a little bit manner. And personally, I, have be, I feel very proud to be a part of this project because I'm sure like... Um, as we also had a discussion on diabetes burnout, and I think that is a, a pretty major uh, topic for when, for when we are dealing with a chronic condition like T1D. And uh, even if we are parents or our friends, they may not be able to understand us. So I'm definitely sure like if you are feeling some sort of stress or anxiety, definitely register a call. And it's not like a phone or friend thing. It's an online uh, sh a schedule a call thing. So you can just uh, schedule a call and it will. it's a very easy process and once you go on the link uh, you will definitely get to understand it in a better way and here mm -hmm. on the next slide I'll just uh, like to share uh, the two of the success stories that we had uh, so we have received calls from newly diagnosed teenagers uh, parents who are concerned about uh, their kids health and food habits uh, which have gone for a toss during the lockdown. And since there are no schools, we had uh, parents who were confused about the future of their kids. Uh, and we have, we have had such uh, wonderful success stories. On, and I think that is something that we are trying to give back to the society as a whole and the T1D community as a whole and have a small baby step towards making the T1D community stronger. Okay, so um, we're going to quickly end this with um, something that uh, we, we think is extremely important. Um, we just, we kind of wanted to talk about the lockdown and how it's impacting um, everybody in the diabetes community space. Um, and we believe that um, 
you know somebody earlier said or david just had his session and he spoke about how he's built an entire career around uh, social media um and online platforms we feel that uh, we wanted to make sure that we leverage everything that's available to us we were definitely social distancing uh, but we didn't want to be socially distant uh, with our community so um since the lockdown in march what we've done is we've come up with the concept of blue circle workshops and uh, we've literally had workshops from um discussing you know about complications where which were educative in nature to having completely recreation um workshops which are like this quarantine dance party where uh, four type ones literally just uh, had a blast uh, hosting a virtual party so um the idea for us is that um no matter what the situation always remember that um you need to make sure that you find your support system there's a huge beautiful class out there so sure. so there's a huge beautiful community out there um whether virtually whether physically uh, whatever works for you uh, make sure that you reach out you find the people uh, you're comfortable with and um, you just uh, thrive and grow so um thank you so much for giving us this opportunity and um, we're very very happy um, thank you thank you sneha thank, thank you chavi it was it's a great program i talked about it multiple times in the past that it's a great idea to have this kind of support that you can just call and you know have someone so i'm just going to open up the panel in a bit but before that just a quick rapid fire round with both of you so uh we'll go with chavi first pen or sketch pen pen uh sneha so favorite bollywood film kaun hona ho nice um Okay, fill in the blanks. Nothing brings type one diabetics together like a quarantine dance dance party. I <laughs> saw these people dancing their hearts out. <laughs> I think food. Uh, Sneha, if hyper was an emoji, it would be that confused emoji, you know, like the yeah, like that, yeah. <laughs> And Shavi, hypo was an emo emoji. Oh, sleep! That zo 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 thing. <laughs> Sneha, poha or upma? Poha. Poha. And finally, uh, Chavi, you are type one of a kind because because I feel like a uh, unicorn has been my spirit animal even before my diagnosis. I, I like think it. I think I was destined to hope for this life. Amazing! Thank you guys so much. And can I Thank request uh, David, Amy, and Sarah to also just turn on their videos for the last bit? And Sahil, over to you. Yeah. So. amazing session uh, sneha and chavi and i personally like the buddy, pro uh, buddy project very much uh, i have question for uh, the buddy project specifically sure. is uh, so as uh, being a psychology student as well and talking to a lot of type one for the last 4 5 years what i have seen is when you talk to a new uh, newly diagnosed uh, type one diabetic or someone who has not been open about their condition so and they will like they will hesitate to call you first like on the on the helpline or one on one so how do you deal with that because uh talking to someone who is accepting and they are trying to improve is a different thing and someone who is not even accepting and not uh, even able to express their uh, feelings with type 1 or whatever the problems they are facing Uh, how do you do that and i know it's very difficult to do that on a phone call because i have seen that so yeah um i'll take that sir okay so i think the whole um, talk that we had was around the fact that you've got to make peace with your diagnosis and then start yeah. finding your place in the community and uh, there's no straight linear route to doing that everybody has our own, their own journey you have had yours i have had mine so um, you've got to be available whoever reaches out to you um, and make sure that your journey is inspiring enough for them to reach out to you um, you right. cannot force this uh, you cannot force this at all that's what i've learned and it's true it's a very organic process and Absolutely. i think the the uh, the thread that we are getting from every one session was mm -hmm. about peer support was about community Absolutely. building right. and all of you touched base on that in some way Absolutely. or the other 
So I would just like to end. Um, I mean, Sahil will do the ending, but just want to ask, uh, and everyone can answer this. But what has been that one moment of peer support in your life that has changed the way you're looking at your management or um, just generally diabetes? So, Amy or Sarah, would you like to start? Um, yeah, I'm happy to. Um, so I think for me, just kind of discovering the whole diabetes community on Twitter to start off with was a huge thing for me because it was kind of like. I was quite lucky in the sense that I did grow up with a few, knowing a few other people with type one diabetes, but, and also my mum is type one diabetic as well. Um, but I kind of went from having maybe like five people that I knew to sort of hundreds. Um, and then also hear, through that kind of hearing people in the community share their experiences of, you know, eating disorder recovery, burnout, depression, things like that um, made a huge difference to me and kind of made me realize that I wasn't so alone in mine amazing actually because um i follow amy on twitter as well and on twitter they have a gb doc hashtag which is great britain diabetes online community and we were in fact inspired by them to start the in doc hashtag which is the indian diabetes online community and i think uh, seeing the tweets and stuff there's a huge support out there so twitter is one way of peer support sarah i think um for me the turning point was um in in person experience so um, for me, I started a diabetes support group in the Boston area for women back in 2013. And I was 23 and only just starting to take care of myself and thought, who's going to come to my support group? And, and I was able to connect with women of all ages. And what I realized um, was that, you know, we all show up as we are and we bring different things to the table. So there were women who had gone through pregnancy, through menopause, and, you know, I might be the person facilitating the meetup, but here I am, you know, I'm heading into life. These are things that are going to come my way someday. And um, just that, that linear um, leadership, I think rather than like that top down authority, you know, it's not about, um, you know, having somebody on a pedestal. It's, it's, we're all here. This is, this is a horizontal line and, and we all can join hands and participate together. Um, I think what comes to mind too, is maybe the first yoga class I did with other type ones and you hear the Dexcom go off and it's not yours, or maybe it is yours, but everyone it's okay you're not embarrassed and it's not weird and and everyone knows what it is and I think that um also maybe was one of the cooler moments amazing I think that is a it's a great turning point uh David your like aha moment yeah I think for me is um I kind of touched touched on this in my presentation but um, I had been craving this community for su such a long time and once I finally got out and met people with diabetes and felt like, wow, there are other people out there who go through the exact same thing I do. Um, and just physically being in, in a space with other diabetics, kind of like what Sarah and Amy said, just finding out um, there is this large community out there that we can all connect with one another. And, you know, we don't have to feel like one person is speaking and we're all learning from that one person. We're all learning from each other. And so, you know, this dream that I had to meet people when it finally came to be, that was kind of my, my turning point as well. And I think, uh, so, you know, there's Twitter community, there's an Instagram community. I think this is very um, Indian, but we have a WhatsApp community, uh, which yeah. is like a, these different <laughs> WhatsApp groups that we have as well. I don't know how much it is in, in the UK or in the US, but I think that's really helped a lot of us as well, that initial type one support group. And I think what David said about empathy is, is absolutely spot on because only someone who feels what you feel can truly empathize with you and then can truly help you in your journey. Uh, so it was a wonderful session, you guys. Sahil, would you want to just wrap up? Yeah, I think uh, just before we end, I like to add uh, a point. So, uh, of course, we have all the communities here. We have WhatsApp groups. We have Instagram support, Twitter and everything. But... One thing that I am very great, grateful to uh, is the support of doctors that we have in India. I don't know about how much is it there in UK or the European countries, but in India, doctors like Dr. Bansi, Dr. Partha, uh, Dr. Uh, Archana, uh, Dr. V. Mohan. So they are not just uh, helping us to manage diabetes, but they are actually supporting different groups of diabetics to come up and like have this movement of awareness and education in India. So I'm, I feel uh, all of 
us are actually grateful to them for uh, for let us being who we are and just uh, expressing ourselves with diabetes there no absolutely and i think our entire panel of advisors the vote of thanks is coming right yeah. after this but we have a whole bunch of panel of advisors whose uh, support has made this conference possible right so big thank you to them thank you sahil for being a wonderful moderator thank you sneha chapi david sara amy thank you all for your wonderful talks and sessions you've definitely inspired a lot of people and with that we end the symposium thank you all so much thank you so much thank you thank you thank you, thank you. So oh, we are at the end. Wow, that was a long day, but it was a beautiful day uh, with lots of talks, lots of inspiration. And um, Indu, would you please go ahead with the vote of thanks? Okay, yeah, it, it, that's a wonderful symposium that just ended, and I'm sure, just like me, all of us feel really thrilled, you know, seeing everybody together, connected as one. you know one big community <laughs> across all the borders you know and uh, it's been a beautiful day like jas said it's been fun it's been educative we have come to see a lot of different perspectives a lot of different experiences along with you know learning about new tech learning about how others are doing it and you know <laughs> let me just get into my uh, this thing i cannot thank enough the all our national and international faculty who have taken you know Uh, time of their schedules especially the international faculty who have actually you know they had to rise up so early in the morning yeah oh my god i'm so uh, i'm so thrilled that you guys took that consideration and are here with us it was so much fun having you all and thank you so much from the bottom of my heart next i would love to thank the uh, panel of advisors that we have you know these people have been always with us always encouraging always giving us their blessings their support So let me thank our panel of advisors, Dr. V. Mohan, Dr. Banshi Sabu, Dr. Apna Sarda, Dr. Patha Kar, the Dr. Shashank Joshi, Dr. Jodi Dev Keshavdev, and Dr. Ramesh Goyal. Thank you so much, doctors. We really love you, and we really appreciate the support you're giving to us. And let me just thank the organizing committee who have worked day in, day out, you know, to get this uh, conference. This, this huge thing you know organized together so thank you jas sedi uh, pragya bakshi nupur lalwani chavi chadda rohan arora snehal sahilo madan apurva gomba kiran barus pooja dusad kamlesh chitte and yes i would like to thank the digital and the media committee pooja bhave diksha hanova sanjana mohan the logistical and the registration committee diksha dev myself uh, ritika maheshwari and uh, the managing committee there is hardik chandarana and his rx events team who have brought this all together thank you so much and last but not the least definitely not the least i would so much love to thank all the delegates who have you know come here participated and made this a true conference you know a connect one because you being here that's what makes us happy because this is definitely for all of us it's like a family event i'm so happy that this happened and uh, that is it we are at the end of connect 1 2020 until we see everybody and more maybe uh, in the next one in connect 1 2021 uh, this is thank you from the bottom of my heart thank you stay safe stay strong thank you indu thank you so much for mentioning all the people involved in this Uh, again my personal gratitude to whoever she has mentioned hardik and rx team event thank you so much for all the technical work you've put into this a panel of advisors our organizing committees all the patient groups who are behind this uh, blue circle um, dia day kunan uh, daya care trust and of course my entire diabetes team who have worked incredibly hard to get this to life so thank you entire team diabetes thank you all the delegates thank you indu for that beautiful anchoring and we will see you all 2021 in person we will connect as gaurav kapoor said in the start so with that this is done it's a wrap i'm taking a break for two days now <laughs> thank you all bye bye take care bye